Hi and welcome back. This episode is kind of a reprise of episode 38. So if you haven't seen episode 38 yet, then I'll put a link up here in the top corner. Go and watch it. We'll wait. Well, after the mini lathe KO'd me in the last episode, and then the mahu put the boot in while I was on the ground, I kind of sulked for a couple of days, but then thought, can't let these silly little machines beat me, can I? Well, I've been thinking about what I did wrong last week, and why the mini lathe kicked my butt. The first few things were pretty obvious, I guess. Um, so these ER collets, being double sprung collets, grip both at the front and the back, and they need the stock to be in about two-thirds of the collet depth, but I was only, I think I had 15 millimeters of uh, depth to it. In fact, now by then I already had a radius on the end, so it's probably less. I probably only had like 12 millimeters, so that was too little. That's a lot of the reason why the thing easily pulled out or moved in the collet. Um, second thing is I got that crappy thread on my collet chuck, so that probably didn't clamp hard enough. I'll switch over to a normal chuck. I wish all lathes had cam lock noses. The next point there is I had the whole 40 millimeters sticking out of the collet chuck. So I could have done it in two setups. First clamping it short, cutting the thread, then clamping it long to cut the second uh, shank. That would have helped. Other option, probably the better option, putting a tailstock support in to support the thread. A CNC lathe needs a little bit of Z distance to synchronize the motion of this tool to the spindle before it actually starts cutting the thread. So if I want to use a center in the tailstock, I need some relief on that center to be able to get this, uh, this tool along its drive line. I'm gonna to have to remove some material along, like here. And like that. So this would be fine to do the job. Nah. So here's the setup. That's my drilling vise. This is an indexer which takes the collets from the lathe. Luckily I've got a number two Morse collet. So I can just put my center straight in there. Right now, just index it around uh, 180 degrees. Now I know I don't really need a tool grinder, but they do make for very professional looking tools. So that's gonna give us a nice bit of clearance now. So I'll be able to come start my threading pass well down here. In terms of steel, my first attempt was with this mystery metal. It cut horribly. Went through my drops. I think I might actually have a, a piece of uh, leaded steel. So this time, Different mystery metal. I'm not sure how I ended up choosing 1500 RPM. I think that was a bit of a holdover from the carbide I used for the first turning passes. Because the threading tool is high speed steel, it should have been down at about 25 meters per minute, I guess, surface speed, which comes out about 800 RPM, roughly. So yeah, that was a mistake. And if I put it in a low ratio, it'll have two and a half times the torque, so it shouldn't. Uh, it should be able to keep a much more constant 
RPM. As the load comes on, it shouldn't, uh, shouldn't sag at all, so that can be done. Yeah, with respect to feeds being too deep and not regressive, and the flank angle, what I mean is this. When you're cutting a thread, in this case 60 degrees, the worst way of doing it is just straight in feed. So what you've got here is the first pass takes some area of cut. The second pass, going in the same depth, if that's the depth, that'll be the same depth. Those can be equal. Takes a much deeper cut. And then as the uh, thread progresses, I mean in this case, let's say we're taking three passes, the area of cut of the third pass is much, much greater than the area of the first pass. There are two things you can do to improve that. The first being advancing down a flank. So if this is your first cut, if you infeed, and normally you do it like 29.5 degrees, if you infeed down a flank, it means that the cutting tool is only cutting on one edge. If the depth of cut is the same, you'll still have this increasing area, but at least you're not having it like wedging into both sides of the cutting tool. And the third thing you can do, in this case we're going to combine both this and this, is to use a regressive cut. So if this is your first area of cut, Linux CNC has a code called uh, G76, which is like multi-pass cutting. And one of its uh, parameters you can set is R for regressive. If you set that to two, what it'll do is try and calculate a constant area. So the second depth of cut will be somewhat less, so that that area is equal to the original area, and it'll keep reducing the depth of cut until the final cut will be a real nice fine cut, so that that is also equal. And that's what we're going to do, sending the infeed down the flank and doing constant area regressive cutting. The last item I could think of, because I'm going to need to regrind this tool anyway, here you can see my poor threading tool. That last crash took the whole tip off it. Now, it was also ground with uh, no top rake. But you can see that both this side and the far side were at the same height. Because I'm going to be going in on one edge, I only need this edge cutting so I can give it a bit of top rake to cut down the cutting forces. So follow me to the Clarkson. I've got quite a lot of meat to remove to get rid of all that damage. So I'll start by offhand grinding it and get it close and then finish it off on the Clarkson. So to set the side relief angles, I just use this, uh, just one of those level, level apps for the telephone. I'll set it to about 8 degrees, should be plenty I'd say. Just gets cloth so I can cool the tool. Now with the first side done, just flip it over. Do the, the other one, other side upside down. Once again, using the phone to set the angle. And then finally that uh, top rake. Few licks on the grinding stone just to take out the tooling marks. Just break the tip, don't need much radius for a M10. And there we have the final grind. See I've rounded the nose just a, a smidgen. And while honing it, it looks like I've put a slightly altered facet along this side.
So let's see how close we got. All right, let's just chase that thread and see if we can improve it. Well, it fits, but it's kind of tight, so I'll just run that again. A few moments later. And that thread doesn't look too bad. There seems to be a little bit of tearing down in the roots. And now it's maho time. The touch off with the edge finder, which is this thing, is what I messed up last week. Basically you touch off one side, zero it, go to the other side. So you should have material thickness plus six millimeters. So I ended up 27.8. And I think I then, when I halved that number to put me on center line, I think my maths ended up as uh, something like 13.4. Yeah, not one of my finest moments there. For a sanity check that that is actually on center, I'm just bringing this uh, engrave it down onto the ruler. Make sure that that is horizontal. Well, it's definitely better than the first one I made, but it's still not perfect. I think, and I'll, I'll see when I edit, but it, it looks like the part moved in the collet while I was milling this flat. There's a bit of a wonkiness to that flat. Nothing like a good bit of bluing to hide the defect there. Make it nice and matte black, and no one will notice all the mistakes. Right, and there we have the finished part. As you can see, there's a little bit of a divot in the head where I think it moved in the collet, but otherwise, it's pretty much how I designed it. The thread came out really nice. I think it helped going over it the, for the extra spring pass. It's made a very nice, pretty smooth uh, thread. There's very, only a very little bit of tearing down in the bottom of it. So let's install it. 
So here's a little before and after of the first horror show and then the one that I think is quite okay. There was a bit of discussion in the forum about this uh, brake slipping and how it might need new shoes, but let's just take it out and have a look, shall we? Well, there's definitely enough uh, brake pad material on there, whatever it is. It's probably asbestos giving this age of machine. But it sure is coated a thick layer of gunge. The main spindle shaft seal between the back gearbox and I guess the, the open area where the belt runs leaks. So you get a little bit of gearbox oil down into that belt area and the belt's distributed it quite, quite evenly everywhere. So the clamp bl block is brass or bronze. Nothing wrong with the shaft. Nothing obviously wrong with the brake pad. There's plenty of plenty of wear surface on it. So I wonder why it was slipping. Where I originally thought the, the pull rod was slipping, once I installed it, I think it's actually slipping through here. But maybe I just need to crank these two, these two screws down a bit tighter. I've put witness marks with uh, with felt pen on both this shaft, which is cranked up really tight, and also on this pull rod, both above and below what I did. And if I stand on it, and it slips, well, maybe it doesn't. Okay, that seems to be good now. No slipping, job done.